Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with FEDS or Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Staying Connected. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in these podcasts are those of the individuals involved and do not represent the opinions of the Marfan Foundation. The Marfan Foundation is not responsible for and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in them, nor does the information constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This show is not produced by or affiliated with the Marfan Foundation or the VEDS movement. I hope you enjoyed the last episode featuring Otto Nitschmann, who was diagnosed with VEDS at 30 years old after a splenic artery rupture. In this episode today, we're going to talk to Grace Irbar, who was diagnosed with VEDS after a spontaneous bowel perforation when she was 12 years old. In this interview, Grace will share her experience with that bowel perforation, as well as what it was like dealing with her VEDS diagnosis from childhood and now as an adult. Thank you, Grace, for sharing your story with me and with everyone on the podcast. Before we go over to the interview, if you like this show and you want to support it, consider joining my Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can make sure this show continues to reach people around the world with real-life stories about vets. You can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent1. I really plan for this show to always be free, so don't worry. Even if you can't support it financially, you can still help support the podcast and make sure it reaches people around the world by sharing it with people you know. Thank you so much for your support. Let's go ahead and go to the interview with Grace. Thank you so much, Grace, for joining me on the podcast and sharing your story with VEDS with everybody. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. Um, I am Grace Irabar, and I was diagnosed at the age of 12. So here we are. How did that diagnosis come about at 12 years old? Yeah. So I was running, it was in the fall. I was running a cross country meet. Um, I just finished my race and I started feeling like pretty significant cramps. And I came home that day and Um, basically long story short, we kind of started thinking it was more of like appendicitis. So I was rushed to the emergency room and they found, um, a significant amount of air and, um, my bowel had ruptured. So that then led to the diagnosis of bed. So during that first surgery, I had a temporary, um, colostomy. And then they were trying to figure out, you know, kind of what were possible causes. And during the colostomy reversal, they had taken um, a sample and sent it over to Seattle with Dr. Byers, who then confirmed um, the diagnosis. So we didn't really find out until a couple months after the initial event. So, yeah, but that's how this whole story started for me in beds. Do you remember what that felt like at 12 years old? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty scary. Um, very, you know, very confused about the whole thing because I really had never been in the hospital before. So that was a lot to deal with as a 12 year old. But um, I will say I was incredibly lucky to have such an amazing team of doctors and nurses. I remember really loving like my child life specialist. I thought that she, like she was awesome. Like she kind of showed me like, but even like before, like I saw the glossy bag, like she had um, this little doll that kind of was like showing me, you know, where the scar was, where um, the colostomy was. And I just was like totally confused by everything. But I think they just did an incredible job making medicine less scary for 12 year olds. Um, So that's something that I've always been continually grateful for that um, I was in such good hands at such a pretty traumatic event. Yeah. Now, did you get to go back to cross country when you, after that experience or like, how did your life change? Yeah. So I was um, out for that season, but then I was able to go back during track 
really like the only thing that at that point that I had known of like scary stuff for beds was, you know, I bruised super easily. So I couldn't play soccer anymore, which is a big bummer, but I was able to get back into running then for that track season. And then I've been a runner ever since. Yeah. I think I saw a Facebook post where you ran a marathon. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy <laughs> stuff. Um, yes, I did. You know, I obviously was told by doctors, you know, hey, like, this isn't the best idea. But we realized, like, you know, you've been a runner since second grade. If you monitor your heart safely, you don't overdo anything. Like, we don't, we're not, like, telling you to do this, but, like, we get it. Because that was just something that I had always wanted to do. Definitely have a love-hate relationship with running, for sure. But that was something that I had just seen just from so my sister has run countless marathons and I had the opportunity to really run a couple of miles of the marathons that she's been in with her and I got to see the finish line of a lot of marathons and it's like one of the most inspiring things to see you know there's so many different ages and sizes and it's just a very pretty emotional sight to behold for sure and I think um, I just it was just always something that I wanted to do. And I thought, hey, you know what? I think this could be a really good opportunity to shed a little light on beds. So I was really lucky to have amazing family and friends. Um, we kind of put together a t-shirt, um, did some fundraising. And then I also had a lot of really good friends and family kind of assign themselves to certain miles. And of course, the day of the marathon, it was just a hot mess there. It was snowy in the beginning. There was sleet, rain, hail. And then at the end, it was just like gorgeous weather out. So I'm like, of course, like, you know, this wasn't going to be easy for me, but it was definitely something that like I wanted to do. And we experienced all four seasons in one day. It was pretty wild, but definitely um, there was a lot of probably um, symbolic um, messages being sent that day through the weather. So yeah, I ran, I finished, not the time I wanted, but I was like, I literally don't care. I just want to cross that finish line and get out of here. Um, but it was definitely something that I didn't want beds to have to take away from me. And I'm glad I stuck with it. I think I maybe want it done, but who knows? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty incredible. I think um, for the the mental aspect of running a marathon, knowing that you have beds has to be pretty intense. Yeah, it was. And I think, um, you know, I've been very open with my close friends and family. And that's why it was so nice to always have, like, I never was running alone, um, you know, literally and like figuratively as well, too. So I, yeah, I just, I just have been really lucky when it comes to that too. But yes, there is definitely a mental aspect for sure. And I can definitely be stubborn. And this was a case of where my stubbornness won in the end. I'm like, no, I'm doing this. I don't care. Like, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so you've been running your whole life. Do you have a family history of VEDS or were you, was this like totally out of the blue when you got that diagnosis? Yeah. So mine was out of the blue. Um, I was a genetic mutation. So I'm one of five kids and I'm the only one that has VEDS. So both my parents were tested. They didn't have it. So um, they're just me. And being diagnosed when you're 12, like it's right, right before your teens. Yeah. How did you handle that as like a teenager into young adulthood? What was that like for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I didn't really know how scary it was until like my later teens. So like, you know, ages from probably 12 until 17, um, you know, my, my biggest you know, griefs were, I can't play soccer anymore, like contact sports. And um, I really didn't know, like, so during that time period, it was fine. You know, like I still bruised really easily. I didn't really kind of, um, I didn't really have to change anything about my lifestyle other than, you know, no contact sports. I wasn't on any medication at that time. Um, so for me, it didn't really 
change until I started asking questions. Um, but yeah, so during that time period after 12, you know, it didn't really change that much other than, you know, I was for a little bit, you know, the girl who went to the hospital a lot. And then other than that, it was like, oh, no, it's okay. Like, you know, Grace will be fine. And I was. How did you handle that when you started getting more information? Yeah. So from 12 to 17, fine. Um, And then before I went off to college, I was like, you know what, might not be a bad idea to get a little bit more information about what exactly is beds. I just want to make sure I, you know, was informed. I had no idea what to expect. I honestly like was, I just thought like, oh, you know, like this is like one thing I can just like check off the list of me getting ready for college. Um, so I met with a geneticist, I was with my mom and one of like the big things was her, you know, saying like, oh, and like, I'm sure you know about the life expectancy. And I'm like, what, like, what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, you know, right now we're looking at like 48 years old. And I like, I had never felt just so outside of my body when I, during that appointment, like it was a very, um, like, I don't even know how to further describe it other than I just didn't feel like I was in my body anymore. Like it was just like, no, like there's no way, like she has to be talking about someone else. And then she kind of was starting to, you know, go down the list of other things that could happen. And I just became like mute. I didn't talk the rest of this appointment. I didn't talk during the car ride home. And um, so that was not the best way, but I don't think there would ever be an easy way to be told how severe this disease is. Um, so then from that time period, I went into my denial stage for sure. Like I was like, I don't want to touch this. I don't want to peel back the curtain. I don't want to look underneath the rock. Like, no, like this, I need, I basically just like went into survival mode, like when it came up with beds and like, um, I know like there's like one example where like my mom was trying to be so nice and like she got me like a t-shirt from like a donation she had made for one of the organizations. And I'm normally pretty like, you know, calm and nice. And like, I took the shirt and I remember just like throwing it. I'm like, no, like, mm -mm, no, 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 thank you. And I think from then that was like a signal of like, okay, like, like nobody in my family really talked about it with me. I'm not sure if they talked about it on their own. I'm assuming they were because, you know, they are so caring and considerate, but I really didn't talk about it then until my twenties. Like I was in my denial stage for sure. (laughs) (laughs) So that lasted a few years. Yes. Yes, it did. (laughs) So did that last like all the way through college or what did you go to college for? So I went to college at the University of Toledo. I majored in recreational therapy with um, the intention of becoming an occupational therapist. So I really started opening up my senior year of college. I had such an amazing group of friends that I had created up until then. And it was just something where they... um, we're kind of starting to piece a couple of things together. Like, you know, like Gracie bruises just really, really easily. Like there has to be like something else going on. Um, and I just like would never talk about it. And, um, so I like had a really good sit down conversation with, um, my roommates at the time. And that was when they kind of really started, for me to be okay with talking about it up until then, like I had talked about like separately with other closer friends and family members, but that specific instance, like when I was a senior in college, I'm like, okay, I'm about to, you know, enter into the real world. So I was like, you know what? I think I need to peel back that curtain and look underneath the rock. And I think I need to start like, looking at this because I don't want this to be something that um, just like festers. Um, I think for me, it's the hardest seeing their faces. It's like you're telling them like I'm dying tomorrow. Like it's so hard to 
take a bit of your pain and give it to someone else. Like I'm sure like you've probably experienced that too, Katie. And it's, it's, it's very, very tough. That's why like I keep a lot of things to myself, but I think it was just being respectful because like they, they knew something like they definitely like knew something was outside the ordinary. So I'm like, I need to be respectful to them and be truthful, but it's, it's a very, very tough truth. It is. So that's kind of when I really started to sit with it and be like, okay, I'm, I think I'm ready now to be a little bit more open. And how has that been for you then? Like since then, like, how have you handled it? Like years go by, how does that change for you? For me, I need experience to teach me how to handle this. Like I needed, um, I needed certain people in my career. I needed certain people, like certain patients I've worked with. I've needed certain teachers to kind of, um, like a message that they say or a conversation I have that leads me to be like, okay, you know what? Like, it's okay for me to start to be open and to start like, this isn't totally the end of the world. Like there are things that like I can still do or that, um, you know, like obviously like a lot of my life goals and dreams were, have been edited dramatically for sure. Um, but that does not mean like I'm stuck. So for me, I just, have had a lot of little life experiences along the way that have helped make it a little bit easier for me to kind of unpack the VEDS box for sure. <laughs> yes. I love the way that you put that unpacking the VEDS yeah. box. <laughs> yes. It's a big box. Yes. <laughs> it's a big box. So you're in the medical field. Yes. And you talked a little bit about how, you know, you've needed certain patients to help you kind of unpack that box, if you will. Yes. Talk a little bit more about that. Like, you know, how have your patients impacted you? Have you, have you had difficult times maybe seeing yourself in another patient or how is that like being a medical provider? Yeah. So I started off my career, um, working in the geriatric setting, which I absolutely love. So I think that was probably the gentlest way for me to start off being a therapist. I learned so many amazing life lessons from them. They don't sugarcoat anything. They are just very open. And I think I learned a lot of lessons from them kind of being like, you know what, like you, like you, like we can get through anything. They kind of like gave me a perspective of, yeah, like if you are dealt a really rough hand that doesn't mean that you quit like you have to keep going um so that was a really great start in my career and then yes like I mean throughout like I did a field work in acute care and I have worked with um younger patients more around my age and the one that really really startled me I was working with a girl right around my age who had experienced a stroke and that really, I was like, Oh my gosh, like, cause it's hard to not see yourself in them because like I, so I've been living with a pseudo aneurysm, a couple of them for probably maybe like seven years now. So like, that's always in the back of my head of like, Hey, that could rupture. It could. So at that instance, when I was working with that patient, I was like, okay, you are not Gracie with VEDS right now. You are Gracie, the OT. So I really had to, I still do. I have to compartmentalize and separate myself or I'm not doing my job. The only part that I will bring in is empathy and understanding like, she was scared out of her mind and I've been there for sure. So that's the piece I bring, but everything else needs to stay outside or else I'm not doing my job. So I've learned that along the way too. And I think, I think a lot of healthcare professionals have to do that. Or again, like you get, you can go down a rabbit hole for sure. So that's, that is what I have used up until now and still do. Yes. Yeah. That's gotta be, that's gotta be so impactful to see someone your age with a stroke and 
those are some pretty yeah. like good lessons that you've taken from from being in the medical field it sounds like yes yeah you there's never a dull moment and there is always always a lesson to learn like I never um I feel like every time I enter work and I leave work I'm a little bit different for sure <laughs> yes now did you always want to be in healthcare, or was that a result of what you went through when you were younger I so definitely was impacted by my experience you know in 12 being in out of the hospital a few times and just being so lucky to have, you know, residents and nurses and child life specialists and doctors really allowing me to ask questions. Cause I was a very curious child. Like I was like, well, what does this do? Why are you doing this? Like what, what's coming next? And they weren't like, oh my gosh, like she's so annoying. Like they were very patient with me. And I think it definitely takes a special person to work in pediatrics too, because, um, I mean, I'm definitely the majority. I think a lot of them are asking questions because it's scary and they have no idea like what's going on and it's all new. And so I was very, very lucky to have that, which a hundred percent impacted my future career goals for sure. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have a lot of nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners in my family and friend circle that it's really nice to be able to share stories with too. And it's just something that I definitely was influenced by for sure. Cause they made medicine not as scary for me for sure. And definitely um, was a driving force with me wanting to pursue healthcare for sure. Cause I know what it's like to be the patient. <laughs> Yeah, that's so cool that that like really inspired you. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a good amount of um, beds patients in healthcare. I feel like I remember seeing a post with that before and it it just, it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I definitely know a handful. So tell me a little bit about um, other things that you've done to raise awareness since you kind of like opened this beds box. Sure, yes. Um So I was really fortunate enough to be um, in a campaign for a possible future treatment for beds. And that was something that really, really changed my perspective of beds too, because up until that point, I'd only met one other person who had beds. And unfortunately, a couple of months before this opportunity to be in the campaign, um, he had passed away. So that was something that I was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, this is really, really tough. Um, so I was like, you know what? No, like that's even more reason to, and it was just a really incredible experience. I was able to bring my mom and my sister And it was really, really cool for them, especially my mom, because she was for the first time meeting parents of children with beds and she had never done that before. And I just remember her like finding a lot of comfort in that. And she, till this day is still in contact with these parents and find a really immense um, support system through that. So yes, that was, that was definitely a hallmark moment for me where I really was able to share even a little bit more than I was willing to, you know, a few years before that. And I just was, you know, like treated like a movie star. It was amazing. So it was really, really fun in that aspect. And then just being able to see all the progress that was being made and all the hard work and dedication to get this, you know, passed. So it was very inspiring. It was very, um, it was probably like the first time that I associated beds with hope. And because before that, all I would think is beds and 48, 48, like I, and this is probably the most I am very stubborn. And this is another case. I remember after hearing that 48, like, even if I was like, 
filling out like a math problem in class or whatever. And if there was 40 involved, then I thought, no, it's that. And like, I'd be okay with like getting that one wrong. So I'm like, I hate this number. This is really bad. So 48 was like the thing that I up until that point would like associate beds with. So that was a really, really impactful experience. I really, really hope that this campaign is able to come to fruition. I'm still crossing my fingers. We will see um, kind of what the future holds. But again, I'm way more hopeful and optimistic than I was at 17 and hearing the hard truths. Yeah. Well, that's a great perspective. And now I think, um, so that's one upcoming clinical trial and there's two upcoming clinical trials now. Yes. And it's kind of, it's very exciting time. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Um, I'm very, very grateful for sure to be alive during this time and could possibly benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So you were, you were diagnosed at 12 and you're like sample for lack of a better term was sent over to the college and lab at the university of Washington to Peter Byers. Yes. I saw another post where you were like on your way to meet him. Yes. What was that like? I mean, that was like years after your diagnosis, right? Yes, it was. So I was in grad school and um, I had the summer off and I was like, you know what? I really think I need to meet him. Like, I really think I need to put that puzzle piece together too. Cause I think, and make that connection Um, because he was, I mean, Dr. Byers was, you know, kind of the author behind this too. Cause he's the one that made the diagnosis. And I, didn't realize how lucky I was, how quickly that diagnosis was made. I mean, I only waited what a couple months and I've heard of people just waiting years to finally get that confirmed diagnosis. So I really was like, you know what I need? I think I need to meet him. I think that would make me feel a little bit less scared of this. And I just wanted to you know, go to the expert for sure. So yeah, it was truly um I just remember being like really nervous to meet him it's like meeting like a celebrity or like it was just um I remember being really nervous but he is just so calm and so reassuring and just so patient so I'm just a massive Harry Potter fan and he has a huge amount of Dumbledore like acid <laughs> in him for sure. That's immediately like what I was feeling when I like first started talking with him. Like, okay, I'm like, I'm like, I can do this. Like, I'm not nervous anymore. And it was really great. I was able to um, sit down and talk with him for like over close to two hours. It was really, really nice of him um, with my mom and sister. And at this point, it was a different sister, one that didn't come to me for the campaign. So um, and she was one that like so she's younger than me. And the one who came to the campaign was older. So I was more accepting of that because, you know, there's just different dynamics of, you know, older sister versus, you know, how you hang out with your younger sister. Um, And that was a big step for me because my younger sister, you know, you want to shelter and I don't want her to hear all the crazy, scary stuff that's with bed. So she really, really wanted to be there. She really wanted to further understand her knowledge base on what this actually is. Um, so that was a really incredibly special moment. And I'm so lucky that we have him. I mean, he's brilliant and is patient enough to answer all of my wild, crazy questions. Um So yeah, it was truly amazing. Seattle's great. And I loved, I got to see the Meredith Grey house, huge Grey's Anatomy fan too. So it was overall just a truly wonderful trip. I'm so happy I did it. That's wonderful. It sounds kind of like a um, taking power over your diagnosis kind of moment. Yeah. And again, I think it makes it less scary the more you say it out loud. Um, it gives it less, um, power for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if somebody was listening, who was just diagnosed with this or has been struggling even for years, trying to come to terms with it, because I I don't think like you ever fully 
like come to terms with it. There's always something yeah. that pops up that just yes. hurts. What advice would you give to somebody? Yeah. So I think for me, I would definitely meet them where they're at. If they are in the denial phase, say, you know, like I, I see you, I acknowledge that I'm here for you. If you just want me to just sit with you, that's fine. If you want advice, I'll give that to you too. If you're not ready for advice, that's okay. Like you will get there. I think however long that time is, I mean, I had my denial stage for probably like three or four years. And if that's what that person needs, that's what they need. And just to let them know that there is always going to be hope for sure. And I never thought I would say that. Like if you were to, my 17 year old self would be like, are you joking? Like there's no, absolutely not. So to definitely not give up on yourself, keep asking the right questions. But I think for me, um, I definitely meet them wherever they're at right now, because there's so many different phases of this for sure. I mean, it's, it's a grieving process. It truly is at the end of the day. That's kind of how I treat it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And as somebody in the medical field yourself, do you have advice for other physicians for what you would want them to know about what it's like living with this? Yeah, I think definitely listen to us, you know, definitely listen to our day-to-day lives. Be aware that it can affect us in so many different ways. Like we all have the same diagnosis, but it presents in different um, symptoms. It presents at different, you know, dramatic events. I think making sure that it's being taught in medical schools. So I work at um, OSU, which is a teaching hospital. And I know the residents that I've worked with, um, like I had a patient I was working with and I'm like, I think she may have EDS, like the connective version, like just where like the classic type. And the one resident was like, oh my gosh, yeah, like we like, we're just learning about this. Um, So they ended up doing like the test for it. So I think EDS in general is getting way more recognition and it has been a couple of Grey's Anatomy episodes. Um, And I think that's wonderful. That's step one. Now let's look at the different subtypes because VEDS is so, so different than classic type. So we've got the blanket statement. So now let's look down in the subgroups because VEDS is dramatically different and severely different. So making sure that they are being taught this um, is definitely step one for sure. But, and just listening, listening to us. Yeah, I love that. And I think it is so important that, you know, that you underlined like how different the vascular yes. type is from the classical type or the hypermobile type. Like they're all different from each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's one of my pet peeves when I see stuff on TV that just says, you know, they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And it's like, well, what does that mean? You know, it doesn't mean anything yes. without the clarifier of what type, honestly, yes. Um, yes. in my opinion. <laughs> so yes, 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 I agree. And it's so important. Like when you go to an emergency room, with an emer- with an emergency with beds like that that's acknowledged that that you know you are prone to these life threatening events mm-hmm. and if they if they don't recognize that that's a real danger. Yes, I agree, and I still have my little packet of like the emergency packet in my bag always. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your story on the podcast and with everybody. And I really hope that you know, your story helps bring some clarity or whatever anybody listening to this podcast is looking for, you know, I think it's a great way to connect with others. Thank you so much, Grace. Yes. Thank you, Katie. (laughs) 
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in to listen to the podcast today. And thank you again, Grace, for sharing your story with Vads on the show. If you like this show, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media to help us raise awareness of Vads together. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent one. Don't forget to subscribe to staying connected on your podcast player so you don't miss the next episode featuring Dominic Corso on May 14th. Thanks so much, and I will see you soon.